welcome to my thousand subscriber celebration video where I'm going to be responding to hot takes and comments and uh, questions that you've all left uh, on the video and um, yeah I've already said thank you for um, letting me get this milestone you know it's great to know that so many people are interested in my opinions on a regular basis and uh, hopefully it keeps going up from here. It's been a really slow growth, but it's been worth it to know that so many people care about my opinions on a regular basis, despite the fact that it's really only a side hobby. So yeah, I'm just gonna be doing this video as like a thank you to you guys. And also there's a lot of fun comments to be reading here. So I'm hoping you get some enjoyment out of it too. I have my laptop to the side of me right there. So I'm just gonna be looking there to read all the comments and stuff. And um, yeah, thank you again. Thank you. First comment is from Sean Cho. He says, congrats on 1000. Thank you, thank you. And anyways, how has life been? Life has been all right. Life's been okay. It's been Christmas recently. I'm an avid fan of Christmas, so it's been fun. Uh, spending time with family and all that. And um, yeah, just, you know, doing university, listening to music, watching some films. Yeah, life's been okay, thank you. Uh, I don't know what to say, life is just ordinary. I have no like wisdom in me to give you. I have no like life advice. Life has just been fine. Half-assed username has left two hot takes, two of them. His first one is Strange Mercy is the best pop album of the decade. I mean, her self-titled is right there, but you did go for Strange Mercy, which is fine. Um, Strange Mercy is really good, but I do think her self-titled is definitely the better album. Um, uh, it just has so many great tracks on there. Like, it's hit after hit after hit. You know, Birth in Reverse, Prince Johnny, uh, Rattlesnakes, uh, Digital Witness. Like, it's just got all the great pop tunes that she has released in her career on one album. So I'd say that's definitely the better album. It's a respectable hot take, I've got to give you that. But um, for this decade, though, I mean, for the pop highlights, I guess for me would be pure heroin. Um, uh, definitely Pure Heroin, I love that album. Um, more so than Melodrama actually, I, I guess that's considered a hot take now considering Melodrama is the one that people love more. But I prefer Pure Heroin. Visions by Grimes is a great one. Um, and what else is there this decade? Think Piece by Clarence Clarity honestly is one of the highlights too. I mean, I would definitely go as far as saying that is a straight up pop album. Um, I think I'm hyping up Rina Sawayama's next release because her EP is definitely a highlight in the pop uh, genre for this decade, as well as Carly Rae Jepsen's uh, EP, Emotion Side B. I preferred that to the album Emotion. So yeah, there are some major highlights this decade, but I don't know um, what would be like my ranking. I would have to sit down and look at what pop albums came out this decade and you know have a proper think about it. Next hot take is Anderson Pack sounds like a self parody most of the time. Not a fan. Well you know what? I'm not a fan of this hot take. This is terrible. What is wrong with you? Go away. Raj Bosal, I'm sorry if I said your name wrong, um, asks do you like ACDC? If yes what's your favourite album of theirs? You know, I don't hate ACDC actually. I guess it's because since I, when I was like younger, I was surrounded by ACDC through like family members who, you know, are big like, Ooh, rockets, yeah. There are people out there that really do think that like they're one of the worst bands of all time though. Like, mate, they're, come on, they're not that bad. Like, they, I can understand that they're not particularly great. They definitely released the same album over and over and over again and people just fell for it. Um, uh, but I guess that's kind of, you know, one of those things, like if it's not broke, don't fix it. You know, rock fans want that kind of rock, so just give them that every time and they'll they'll be okay with it. But um, yeah, as far as like their music goes, I would never listen to it on my own accord, but I can't say they offend me. They're kind of like Guns N' Roses in a way. Like I don't really feel like I have that much anger towards their music to really care about like Appetite for the Destruction. Like people hate that album, but I'm just like, it's fine. Like they're fine rock songs. So I have no issue with it. Mom Smith says um, congrats and he's been here since 2017. That's awesome. Thank you for being here for so long. And he says, why don't you like Tame Impala's, uh, Tame Impala's current album? I just find it a bit cheesy. I guess cheesy is a really easy adjective to use when you describe music, but I really feel like they just, went in that really like 
cheesy 80s pop direction that I can't really stand. That really like cheap synth pop from the 80s that has aged pretty terribly. Um, I have similar issues with Blood Orange at times. I feel like Blood Orange goes in that direction too and I'm just like this isn't a sound that's very good anymore but I, I think people still like it and that's fine. But yeah, Currents, I just didn't really enjoy it, to be honest. Um, it's okay at times. I think the best track is uh, Let It Happen, though. Um, that's a great song. But yeah, other than that, I wasn't really a fan. And he also asks, out of the three albums from Fleet Foxes, what's your favourite? It's got to be the debut. I actually think it goes the debut, Helplessness Blues, and then the latest one. Crack Up was really good, but it's definitely a step down from their previous material. But um, I love their previous material so much though that anything was probably gonna be a step down. Nick Moss, who's a regular commenter, says congrats and hope you get thousands more. I love that too, thank you, Nick. Um, he says, did you think football was coming home? Yes, I did, I was a fool, all right? Uh, look, uh, before the competition started, this is the World Cup, by the way, in case you didn't know, um, I was like, yeah, England aren't even going to get past the quarterfinals because that's just what we do every time. But when we, like, you know, did well in the group stage and then everything was just, like, set up, like, the, the, all the teams that England could face were some of the easiest teams they could have faced in the competition. So I was like, England are going to do this. Like, they can easily beat Sweden. They can easily beat, like, Colombia and stuff like that. And uh, obviously Croatia came around and just, you know fucked everything up. So yeah, I was naive to think that, but it was fun to watch, I must say. He asks an interesting question here as well. Do you think you'll ever give a review a 10? And realistically, I don't know if I ever will. Like 10 out of 10 albums for me grow on me over time. Like I can't, like I, I, I don't think I've ever been able to say like this album is a perfect 10 out of 10 within like a f the first few weeks of it coming out. Like I don't think there's ever been an album Probably To Pimp a Butterfly was the uh, closest to that, but I think it actually took even still quite a while for me to realise how perfect it was because there was so much to digest and because it's quite a lengthy album, I wasn't like listening to it over and over again. I was listening to it over periods of time. Um, but obviously I didn't have a channel back then, so I don't know if I would have given it a perfect 10 even back then, but yeah, I don't know if I will. I appreciate that people are able to do it, but I'm just thinking to myself like realistically, do I honestly think I could give an album a perfect score like within five to seven days of it coming out? I don't think so, unless I left the review for a month or something, then maybe, but we'll see, I don't know. Also asks favorite uh, songwriter of all time. I don't think I can answer questions like this. Like it's too narrow. Like of all time, I have to narrow it down to one person. I, it's really difficult for me, so I'm sorry I can't answer this. Talking techno leaves a hot take here. Homework by Daft Punk is stupidly overrated. It's actually a 5 out of 10. Is it actually? I will agree that it is influential, but people who were influenced by this album have made albums that are better than it. Yeah, actually, I agree, you know? It is definitely that definitive album where, like, it started something in a genre of music and then everything after it kind of made it better. There are always albums like that in a lot of genres of music. I feel like the Jesus and Mary Chain are a good example, too. But, um, yeah, I I'm not that big, uh, big of a fan of uh, Homework. I actually really don't like many of the tracks on there, especially around the world. I find it really irritating. But Defunk? I'll listen to the funk all day long because that's a great track. And funny that I just mentioned uh, Jesus and Mary Jane actually because uh, Harry TC, shout out to Harry, um, he leaves a hot take here. It may have set the standards and building blocks for shoegaze and music years after its release, but Psycho Candy is a really weak album, especially in comparison to later shoegaze albums like Suvlaki, Rays, Loveless, etc, etc. And yeah, I absolutely agree with this. Um, I think a lot of people agree with this, to be honest, at this point. Um, but yeah, I mean, Just Like Honey is an amazing song. Like, I think that's such a great opening track to the album. And uh, Stands on its own is a great song too. But yeah, it really is quite weak in comparison to most shoegaze albums. But I will leave an even bigger hot take here and say I don't think Loveless is that great, to be honest. I'm not really a big fan of Loveless. I think it's, uh, I think it's good, but I don't think it's like one of the greatest albums of all time that many people consider it to be. So, you know, um, I guess... 
I'll leave that for what it is. Harry also asks, um, any albums you really want to like but can't seem to get? And I guess that would probably be Loveless. I mean, I enjoy it. I think it's like a 7 out of 10. It's a solid album, but um, I don't get it in the way that it's like this masterpiece of an album, to be honest. Like, I think Shoegaze in general is a genre for me where I'm just kind of like on the fence with it because too much of the time, like the vocals seem very robotic to me the music is kind of you know messy in its sound and i guess that's supposed to be the point of it but i can't ever really get a handle on the emotions that are being displayed like there's always seems to be a disconnect between the lyrics and the way the singer is singing those lyrics but that's just for me i guess it's one of those things but yeah, I guess Loveless would be that album. NOS Paddy leaves a hot take here saying, Lou Reed's best solo album is Metal Machine Music. Well, I haven't heard a lot of Lou Reed's solo material, but I don't think Metal Machine Music is that good, to be honest. Like, I think it's kind of average. I think it drags on a little bit and the music gets pretty stale quite quickly. But I respect that take because I don't think many people would agree with that. So, yeah, I can't really get too mad there. Stephen Jones asks, if eating ass was an album, what album would it be? Madonna's self-titled, obviously. It's obviously Madonna's self-titled. Just ask better questions next time, please. Eve's boy says, congratulations on this milestone. Thank you very much. And he leaves two hot takes here saying that LP's solo work is much better than his work with Run The Jewels. Run The Jewels is still great though, as he says. Um, I don't know if it's much better, but I can definitely see the argument for why you would think it is better. But I don't know if like, you know, like I, was, I would put Run The Jewels 2 on par with most of his solo work, to be honest, or even higher. Because his 2012 album was pretty not that good, to be honest. <laughs> But Fantastic Damage is amazing, and his production in the 2000s was quite amazing too. His work with Aesop Rock, Cannibal Ox, and um, uh, Mr. Liff, it was all really, really good. So yeah, I can see why you'd say that. His other hot take is Joy Division's Unknown Pleasures is better than Closer. I don't know if this is a hot take, to be honest. I feel like most people consider both albums like amazing, so you could interchange either. But I, 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 I don't think Joy Division were ever that amazing, if I'm being honest. Like, I think they're pretty good, but I don't really see the hype for them all that much. Apart from, like, individual songs, which are, like, legendary songs. But yeah, I'm not really uh, as on board with Joy Division as many other people seem to be. Just an extra one here that I want to get to because um, this comment came after I had recorded the video. But it's good, so I want to uh, respond to it, and it's from Joshua Routon, who says, Do you have a full-time job and do this on the side? If so, how has uh, it been to manage the time of listening to albums, recording reviews, and maintaining a decent online presence? Well, I used to have a full-time job and did this alongside, but no, this isn't like a full-time thing. This is, you know, there's no monetary benefits to doing this. I just like doing this, talking about music, and many others in the music community do this as well, which I absolutely appreciate. Um, you know, we all just kind of love music to the point where we just want to talk about it. If it ever came to a point where there was monetary gain, which I, I kind of highly doubt, um, to be honest, for me anyway, um, then that would be great. That would actually be amazing. But, um, you know, I'm doing a degree in teaching, so it's not really like a priority for this to be um, financially, uh, you know, a financial gain for me. Actually, you know what? I don't know how the hell I do it or how the hell I did it because I used to actually work a full-time job, uh, you know, Monday to Friday and then on weekends I worked at a pub and I was still doing videos, believe it or not, since 2017 for like a year and about four or five months, probably call it like a year and a half. That's what I was doing, two jobs plus YouTube. Um, really weird that I was able to do that. So. I never have an issue with managing time, listening to music. It's just such a passion for me that it's kind of like the thing that I do the most. Obviously, I have friends and, you know, a girlfriend and that kind of thing. So everything is all balanced, uh, family and stuff like that. It's all balanced. But yeah, I just managed to find the time. Um, I think 
many can agree to um, that you just uh, you just end up finding time even if it can be sometimes like you're doing a bit too much just take a few days break and then get back to it and luckily I still have a bit of time while I'm at university maybe things will slow down um, as university gets more intense but I will warn anyone of that um, before I, you know, just suddenly disappear for a while if I ever take a hiatus, that'll be why and I'll explain why, but I, even now I can't see that happening in the near future, it's just my first year, everyone knows in the UK that first year of university doesn't actually account towards anything, which is kind of bollocks, but it's just one of those things, so I think it's kind of okay for now. But he's left a spicy take here, a spicy take, Brockhampton will be seen as the current younger generation's Wu-Tang in the future. In brackets, he's put, I don't believe this will be the case, lol. Well, I thank God that you do not believe this will be the case, because that is not going to happen. <laughs> Disrespect to Brockhampton, I praised them a lot when they initially came out, but as my good friend Josh the Blogger mentioned recently, and I said uh, quite recently as well, that they were just an in-the-moment fad, I think. I don't think they've continued with the greatness that they put out initially and actually you know what here's a hot take for you all i don't like saturation one anymore i actually think it's quite bad to the point where I, i'm baffled by this because when it initially came out i was calling it one of the best albums of the year and it made my year end list but now i think it's actually quite bad i think the mixing of the vocals on the album is terrible and it only got worse on iridescence to be honest um so yeah, I think they've kind of lost that spark, that in the moment spark that they had. But if you put a compilation of their best songs all onto one album, you'd have a great album. But I still think they're really just kind of, the odd track here and there is great. Uh, I don't know if they'll be remembered very well in the future. Maybe from teenagers that absolutely adored them and younger people that adored them at the time. But I don't think any of their albums will hold up in the way that we want them to or maybe saturation 2 will i know everyone still loves that one that might hold up but i think that'll be about it still enjoy saturation 3 though still really like saturation 3 and um, probably my favorite of theirs but even still it's not quite as good as it initially came out for me i don't enjoy it the same way so yeah they're just kind of in the moment i think i don't think they'll hold up like um you know 36 chambers to be honest um but even still, Wu-Tang had a lot of bad albums, so uh, yeah, you know, who knows, I don't know. David Rowe asks, why are you a member of the alt-right? Because it's cool, man, we got the best memes over here. I mean, the alt-right is filled with the coolest people, the coolest takes. <laughs> Luke Zika asks a few uh, questions here. He says, um, what's your favourite album from the 90s, 2000s? Well, um, a while back I did some topsters um, of like my favourite albums of the 70s, 80s. And I did plan on doing the 90s and 2000s next, so I guess I'll leave that unanswered until I do that. Follow me on Twitter if you're not already following me on Twitter, by the way, because they will be left there. How many albums would you roughly say are a 10 out of 10? Um, well, if you don't follow me on Rating Music, you should do that as well, because I have all my like ratings there. And I think I have about like 47 or something uh, 10 out of 10 albums. Um, which I'm pretty confident about, which, um, you know, if you want to have a look at them, have a check and see which ones are my 10 out of 10s. And he finally asks, what's an album critics hate but you love? I can't think of any of this off my head. Like, I'm really struggling to think of an album that critics hate but I love. Generally, that doesn't seem to happen. It's usually the other way around, actually. Um, but yeah, I can't think of any that I genuinely love that most critics don't like. Um, no. My boy Josh Quinn says, congrats uncle. Thank you, nephew. I appreciate that. He asks, which artist would you most like to see come out of hiatus, no matter how unlikely it would be? I can't think of many artists that I really love that are in hiatus. Um, I mean, there are probably loads, but nothing off the top of my head. But the only artist I can think of for this question would be Fiona Apple. But I don't know if she's technically in a hiatus. I think she just doesn't release music very often, which is fine, but I would love to see her drop another album before the decade is out, or at least within the next few years, because I absolutely love her music. So um, it's a shame to not, it's a shame that we don't get much music from her, but usually it's so good that I don't think the weight is that much of an issue anyway. His hot take is Pet Sounds has aged really badly and is nowhere near as charming as people say it is. Well, we've had this discussion before, actually, me and Josh. And um, I must say, I highly disagree. 
Um, but um, yeah, I don't know. People say like the vocal mixing and uh, you know, like the sound of the album is just really flat, but I don't get it. I think it's such a great album. Like, uh, I, I, I don't, I, I, it's one of those albums that I just don't understand how people have such an issue with. Like, I just think it's so well made. The pop music on there is great, and even the deeper cuts are great too. I don't know, I just don't see this take. I'm sorry, man. Neil's Reviews Music asks, what do you think of Michael, Michael Bublé? Michael Bublé, um, look, he, he heard a few Frank Sinatra albums and thought, hey, you know what, I can do that too. And most of the singles that got released um, were just ugh, icky and ugh, soppy, and nah, man, not a fan. Um, surprised at how big he got, I guess because he's a good looking guy. People just buy into that kind of crap, don't they? So, yeah, no. And his hot takes? <clears throat> Pizza's just not good. Pizza is. Just... Who are you? Why would you say this? I, I, I can't believe you came here to ruin my day. And he also said Rodeo was a 5 out of 10. I guess I see that actually. I do really like Rodeo, but I do think I do think it became that album where people were just like, "Hey, I don't like trap music, but I like Rodeo." Uh, it definitely became that album, to be honest. But I do like Rodeo quite a bit. I think it, I think Travis did a great job with that, and I think it is better than Astro World too. Well, Cacti leaves a hot take here saying Pine Grove songwriting was never that great, and their frontman has poor word of choice. Also, Rascal Flats are greater than Pine Grove. Well, I've never listened to Rascal Flats, so I will be doing that uh, pretty soon just to see how good they are. And uh, yeah, I, I guess Pangrove didn't have the best songwriting in the game, but I, I do like that album that they dropped in 2016. Although I must say they dropped an album this year and literally no one talked about it. I don't know if it has anything to do with the fact that the singer um, had allegations against him or something, I think. So um, perhaps that's why. But yeah, I guess they lost all the momentum. <laughs> that they had in 2016 completely this year because I bet you probably didn't even know they had an album out. Bing Bing Bong um, asks what my favourite punk album is. What is my favourite punk album? Uh, uh, maybe Television's Marky Moon actually. I guess that's more post-punk but um, it definitely falls under the punk category. I think that could be my favourite. Or Patti Smith's Horses. For, oh man, Patti Smith. Ooh. And he asks my favorite jazz album. Um, maybe it's Ryu Fuku's uh, Scenery, possibly. Uh, questions like this are really hard to answer because, like, obviously they're, they're they're genres filled with so many albums and so many great, you know, influential releases. Um, so I guess take those answers for a pinch of salt. But those two, those al albums I mentioned, so those three of them are some of my favourites of all time, for sure. He leaves a hot take here too. Elliot Smith is one of the greatest artists of all time, and a lot of people disregard him because of his sad boy reputation. Very few artists are able to tap into the human condition in the way that he can. That last part I definitely agree with. I don't think he's like the best artist to ever tap into the human condition, honestly. Um, I, I do think his music is good, and some very good releases that he's put out. But yeah, I don't think he, for me, I wouldn't put him as one of the greatest artists of all time, but um, I do definitely understand why people would. But yeah, I don't think his music's quite that amazing, to be honest. If you were a biscuit, which type would you be? I would definitely be a shortbread because you know why? Shortbread is great for all occasions. You don't buy someone chocolate fingers for Christmas. You don't buy someone Jaffa cakes for Christmas, but you do buy them shortbread for Christmas. So I think shortbread is the best you can go for. I, I'm gonna be a shortbread. Rick the Lie, my boy Ricky um, asks, is there an album that is a favorite of yours mainly because you associate it with a specific time, place or memory? I think Charles Bradley's music has that impact on me a little bit, especially his, um, his 2013 album. Um, songs like Victim of Love have like a very, I have a very like strong personal attachment to. And also um, the album that Casey Musgraves put out this year, I, I, I grown to like even more because me and my girlfriend like spent quite a bit this summer listening to that album. So um, yeah, you know, um, I guess there are some occasional like occurrences where this becomes a thing, but generally it's not 
that much of a big deal for me. Usually it's just because I absolutely love an album, but you know, those examples I gave, I guess, are the best I can think of. Also leaves a hot take here too, Lulu by Lou Reed and Metallica. It's actually a raw and riotously good album that has aged far better than expected and was interpreted to be awful upon release, mainly as a result of two unlikely collaborators joining forces in a way that would alienate both their followings. The catch is that Lulu's appeal is pretty separate from that either of the two artists and they complement each other in such an intoxicating and cleverly artful reinvention. I would absolutely agree. I mean, I don't think the album is great or really that good. I think it's okay. I think it's actually pretty decent. I listened to it recently and I got a bit of enjoyment out of it, especially that last song on the album, I think is really, really impactful. But yeah, I mean, it's pretty much obvious as to why this album has become so, so infamous. Um, Metallica fans don't want this at all. I guess Lulu, uh, Lulu? Lou Reed fans would want Lulu more than Metallica fans would, but even still, um, it's a pretty narrow fan base, isn't it? It's a very avant-garde and weird. It's not for your casual listener, and most Metallica fans probably are just your casual listeners that want some heavy metal release uh, that they didn't get with Lulu at all. But even still, if you were like this avant-garde music lover who, you know, only listens to the most weird and obscure type of stuff, I could still imagine you probably wouldn't like Lulu. Like, it's not that great, but I still think it's pretty decent for what it is and definitely doesn't deserve the 1.77 rating it has on rating music. That's kind of weird to me. Sam Bennett asks, who is an artist you think is underrated or on the flip side an artist that is overrated? For underrated, I would definitely go with Suzanne Sunfer. I feel like all of her albums over the past few years that have been fantastic haven't really been picked up by critics at all, despite the fact that I w you would think that this would be very appealing to music lovers, um, uh, but I don't know. And he says as well here, what do you think of Metallica, Megadeth, Slayer and Anthrax? Well, I've unfortunately never listened to Anthrax, but the other three have their moments, I think. I think Slayer, Slayer's debut album is pretty good, and Megadeth's Rust in Pieces is alright too, it's fine. Uh, Metallica is definitely the best out those though. Um, they've got like at least three or four albums that I think are amazing. Fred Jawa, I think is how you pronounce it, has left a few comments here. I'm just going to pick the best one because they're quite lengthy. And uh, they've said, I think being American, British, Australian, etc. has a, dif a disadvantage when it comes to discovering new music. I'm Italian and I love um, Italian artists. We have thousands and thousands of wonderful songs that cry, make me cry or dance. We have big artists that... Uh, English speech English speakers will never listen to unless they obviously move here I have a good knowledge about music sung in English so I can have a talk with all of you about it but I know more more music than you because of all the stuff of my country and that's sad because all of you are missing out on a lot of great stuff just because you don't speak a certain language for sure in USA and UK there have been mu most of the innovators and many of our local artists have been influenced by them but it's sad anyway I'm not talking just about Italy. I got an Argentinian, fr an Argentinian friend who uh, we share a lot of our music. So this thing, it's so this thing is the same for Argentina. They have wonderful music as well, like in every country. I do highly agree here. I think the issue is, is that uh, I don't get it, you know, because like Spanish music. Um, is incredibly popular right now. Like Latin pop has suddenly become the new trend for a lot of, um, you know, for a lot of countries um, that don't speak Spanish. But I don't understand why none of the other, you know, foreign speaking countries don't get the same kind of boost. It must be due to the fact that the music sounds a certain way. To me, I think it's just about the image, to be honest. Um, you know, Latin pop, Spanish type singers have always been considered quite sexy and that kind of stuff. Um, you know, your Enrique Iglesias and uh, I guess Daddy Yankee could be considered part of that group as well. Um, so maybe that's got to do with it, I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, casual music listeners aren't really going to go out their way to find music in general anyway. So it's even less likely that they're gonna find music that they don't understand. But I, for one, this year has, has found, have found so many great 
foreign speaking artists that have put out some of my favorite albums of the year Nino de Elche, uh, Midair Thief, uh, Ichigo Ioba, as, as, there's many more as well. So, yeah, it's definitely a shame, but I just don't really know how to combat that. But I do like how you mentioned that because you're from a different country, you get access to all kinds of music, which I am I'm pretty um, appreciative of that because then you do get a wide array of artists that probably me or many other people don't get. Um, this is my fault because I said leave a comment about politics and someone has made a comment about Brexit. Um, <laughs> Theresa's May, Theresa May's fatal mistake was attempting to negotiate with the EU, which is a completely pointless task. The EU do not go negotiate. No deal Brexit was the only feasible option since the start and the government should have spent the last two years planning for that and giving businesses time to plan. Instead, they have achieved absolutely nothing and now run out of, and now run out of time. She's probably the worst prime minister of all time. <laughs> the thing is, is that you're kind of right that the EU don't negotiate. Like a lot of people are pinning this down on Theresa May and our government for fucking this all up. But if you look at the past history of like negotiations with the EU, they don't go very well. Like there are so many times where countries have voted for something and the EU have just blocked it. It's a very complex situation, but I don't know if a no, no deal would have been the most feasible option. Although you do bring up a good point about how if they'd started right back when the vote was initially made to plan for a no deal Brexit, then maybe there would have been a good plan in place, a good structure, but I do feel as though that could have gone even worse than it ended up being. So it's so complex that I don't even think the people involved know what they're doing with this. So Quality Posts asks, what are my five favorite com comedians? Um, I don't watch as many comedians as I used to, but I do really like Joe Lysett. I like Ramesh quite a lot too. Rod Gilbert has some of my favorite sketches. I think in uh, comedy history. David Mitchell, I think is up there as well. I really love um, his comedy. And uh, for the last one, I guess I'll go Lee Mack because um, Would I Lie To You is probably one of the better panel shows in Britain that we've got right now uh, in terms of comedy pan panel shows anyway. And his hot take is Wide Awake by Parquet Courts is the best rock album of the 2010s so far. Um, I don't know if this will end up going down as a hot take. I think most people will end up agreeing with this years down the line. Hopefully, anyway, I think it's a great album. But um, yeah, I guess um, maybe Like Clockwork is better though by um, uh, Queens of the Stone Age. I could definitely see that one being in the top five, top ten by the end of the decade. Um, what else we got? Tropical Fug Stones album was great. Daughters will probably go down as one of the best rock albums of the decade too. Um, blah, 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 blah. Worry by Jeff Rosenstock actually. I know it's a pop punk album but I definitely think it deserves to be in that conversation because it is definitely a rock album as well. Um, the Drones. The Drones have some great albums too. So yeah, there's a lot of albums actually considering most people think rock is dead. But um, no, I would say rock is um, definitely in a fine position. It's just people seek out the wrong kind of rock, to be honest. Like, you know, there's so much better out there than friggin' Portugal the Man and Imagine Dragons. Half-assed username who left a hot take earlier on has also left a few questions here. Most anticipated releases of 2019, well, there is um, already a video uploaded um, with that, so I guess you can just go watch that video. I am from... Sheffield, but I did initially get raised in Middlesbrough, but now I am living in Chester. So it's like, you know, it's, it's one of the things where you just move around the country. I, yeah. Garrett Monyoki asks, who do you think is a great musician consistently squandered by a waste of potential? His answer is Demi Lovato. I would disagree with Demi Lovato because I don't think she'll ever put anything great out. Uh, she's too commercialized at this point. I don't think she's really in a position to be putting out great albums because she'll just be churning out, um, you know, like really commercialized pop singles. Unless she went independent or something like that, then she could put out something great for sure. In terms of my answer, I would probably go with ASAP Rocky, actually. I think ASAP Rocky has only ever put out really good singles and he's had a lot of albums out and he's had a lot of time to, you know, improve 
and put out something great and he he just ends up putting out really weak material in my opinion also the internet as well as much as i do like um their debut album quite a bit probably more than other people did but even still it definitely had issues and um hive mind was really quite an underwhelming release and so the, the amount of talent as well that they've got in that in that group you would definitely think by now they would have put out something really good. Jid as well, I think, Lana Del Rey, maybe Wolf Alice. I think Wolf Alice could probably do more with their sound than they do, but I don't know if they're wasting their potential. Perhaps they're just gonna consistently put out really safe indie rock albums anyway, I don't know. Liam, the music reviewer says, give me your skincare routine. I need your skincare routine. Uh, <laughs> I, I, a cliche answer would be I do drink a lot of water, but I genuinely do drink a lot of water. I think that probably helps. I don't think my skin's that great, is it? I often get quite flaky, like forehead, uh, like the flaky forehead, the, you know, like will I will. But yeah, I, I do moisturize. I guess that's frowned upon for men to do, but you know, there, there are male moisturizing products it's not bad to do that you can do it uh, i won't judge you i don't think many people will care that you do it either um yeah just go by that and smooth your face if you want i spare leaves a few comments here at, look at there's a few of them i'm not really familiar with so i'm just going to answer the one that i'm mostly um you know knowledge in and his hot take is Going through the entire history of an artist before you actually start the review is boring. Reviewers should cut that part out of their reviews. I kind of agree and I do this quite frequently as well. I've often realized I've spent like two or three minutes talking about like the artist's previous work before I actually get into a review and I need to stop doing that. I actually really appreciate the way Buffalo Staple does his reviews because he just doesn't do that at all. He just goes straight in with his opinions on the album that he's talking about. Like the Lie also does this very well too. Um, yeah, I mean, the thing is, is that I like to leave some kind of like background information in case it's an artist I've never talked about before and people are like, oh, I wonder what he thinks of this artist's last album. You know what I mean? So I just do it anyway. But yeah, it does waste a lot of time and probably is unnecessary. So I kind of see what you mean. Druid leaves a few questions here. One of the questions is, is your current style of video shooting and editing sticking around or have you always aimed on experimenting with the formula? I'm not really sure how I can experiment with what I do unless I improve the, the, the um the like video production side of things i'm not entirely sure if i'll ever change it up but i do think it looks quite amateur most of the time and perhaps that probably could be improved and probably would have helped me um garner a bigger following by now if my videos did look a little bit better but um you know i'm not particularly great with video editing i'm not a talented uh, guy when it comes to that kind of stuff um friggin hell if you were in my ict classes at school my computing classes at school you would know why I wasn't good at it, because believe me, <laughs> friggin' computing lessons in the UK in the 2000s were terrible. Um, but anyone that's around the age of 16, 17, 18, um, did luckily start to get better, you know, computing lessons at school, so they're probably better at editing and stuff. But yeah, I'm not talented in that area at all. But I do know my stuff, I think, when it comes to music, so that's kind of what the purpose of this for me is. So yeah, I guess I'm just gonna keep it as it is right now and hopefully people are here for the opinions and they don't mind too much that my videos don't look that great. The other question they ask is, why does Death Grips get a free pass and critical acclaim from near everybody on every release, but horror and Black Hand Path seem to go relatively unrecognized for a more focused version of the sound? Well, I will have to check out Black Hand Path because I do not know who that artist is. But I think in regards to horror, um, I do think most of their projects are kind of messy. And usually there's like one or two really good songs on each of the releases that they put out. And the rest of the album is kind of throwaway. But I do uh, understand the point you bring up when it comes to uh, Death Grips. Because I think like even Year of the Snitch was definitely one of their weakest albums. And yet everyone seemed to just completely jizz all over it. Um, which was kind of baffling to me. But um, yeah, to be fair, they're very innovative. There's no one that can make music like Death Grips, I don't think. Um, so even if you can find the most underground, you know, experimental hip-hop, experimental noise artists out there, 
they're probably not on the level of Death Grips. You've got to give Death Grips credit for what they do. And the last hot take I'm going to respond to, um, because I've done a lot already now, is CD is highly overrated, vinyl is infinitely better. Well, I don't think anyone is really out here overrating CD anymore. If anything, people are overrating vinyl. And as much as I like vinyl and I collect vinyl and I have a lot of vinyl and I will continue to purchase vinyl, um, I would say it's definitely getting to the point where it's overrated because the prices of vinyl are very high. I don't know what it's like in other countries, but in the UK you often pay around £20 per one vinyl, sometimes even more depending on where you go, um, which is like, you know, more than $20 if you were to exchange it to US um, dollars. Um, it's a lot of money, man. I mean, if you're, if you're a teenager, and you like collecting vinyl, I, I do wonder where, you know, you find the money for it because I, I can't purchase much vinyl very regularly um, because it's just so expensive. But no, I don't think it is infinitely better and actually I would definitely go as far as saying that, um, you know, it, the, the quality of vinyl is usually much better than CD, but if you want a money-saving tactic, I would definitely go for CDs, to be honest. Unless you are mega rich, then money isn't a problem to you, and then just go and buy vinyl anyway, and just ignore what I'm saying. And that is it. I'm gonna leave it there. I'm sorry if I didn't reply to any of your questions or hot takes. It will probably be because I didn't have much to say on what you said, and I apologize for that, but I have responded to as many as I possibly can. And um, yeah, I think I've done quite a lot here anyway. Thank you to everyone for watching. Thank you to everyone for engaging in this. I appreciate it a lot. It's been really fun to do this. I hope you had a lot of enjoyment out of this video. And um, yeah, thank you again for a thousand. Hopefully I continue growing from here and eventually hit 2000. And uh, you know, it's awesome. It's really fun to do this. I thank you all for watching and supporting. Hope you enjoy this video. Thank you. Goodbye. My voice is dead. I'm tired. Uh...